that. <laughs> Remember why it is the uh, receiver was under here and not up there. <laughs> I think we just remembered. Okay, um, well, let's, um, let's look at our text this evening. As you've already heard, we're continuing through Psalm 119. We really only have two sections after this one uh, before we're finished with this psalm, which we'd say is one of the shorter ones in Scripture. Actually, it, it is the longest chapter, you might say, with, within Scripture, 176 verses. But this evening, we're looking at verses 153 through 160. You've already heard and seen in your bulletin that we're looking at how, at least what this psalm tells us about how the believer and the unbeliever differ, that's pretty broad. This morning we saw that they differ specifically in the fact that the believer has the Spirit of God and the unbeliever doesn't. But what is it that the Spirit of God is doing in the believer that makes him differ from the unbeliever and how does that change the response that the Lord has toward both the believer and the unbeliever? And how will they differ when they are faced the situations where they need to call out to the Lord for help. Well, we're going to see that uh, in this section of Psalm 119. The psalmist writes, Look upon my affliction and rescue me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great are your mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to your ordinances. Many are my persecutors and my adversaries, yet I do not turn aside from your testimonies. I behold the treacherous and loathe them because they do not keep your word. Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. The sum of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. Well, again, may the Lord help us to see old things and new things uh, from this particular passage uh, this evening. Now, remember this morning we saw that in the new covenant, the Lord gives us His Holy Spirit to form Christ in you. Remember, He, he does this by setting you free from your sin. And the way He sets you free from sin is simply by opening your eyes to something you couldn't see before which is the beauty of Jesus Christ, that which we saw this morning Paul was calling the glory of the Lord, and that glory is the beauty of His holiness. Unbelievers don't find that beautiful. They don't desire it. They desire things that the Lord doesn't like, things that He actually hates. They don't see the beauty in what He sees beauty in, but the Spirit of God changes that. He opens your eyes to see that beauty, and we saw also that He fixes your eyes on it. He fixes your eyes on Christ, on those various facets of His glory, and as He does, He forms that same image in you because He gives you a desire for that particular characteristic. He makes you want to become that way, to put those things on so that you become more like Him. Now, that means that there's going to be a change in your life. When the Lord gives you His Spirit, it's going to be a radical change, a change in how you view God. Uh, the unbelievers characterized as hating God, and you used to hate Him, but when the Spirit of God came into your heart, now you love Him. Uh, it'll change your view of Jesus Christ. Without the Spirit of God, you would have been like the Jews, siding with Him, saying that He deserved to be crucified. You would have denied Him. You were denying Him, but now you trust Him. It changes your view of the church, and I don't mean the building, of course, but the people of God. Perhaps before you saw Christians as somewhat backwards, maybe prudish, out of step with the world, and certainly Christians are out of step with the world, but hopefully in step with Christ. Maybe you saw them as fanatics, religious fanatics, but now the Spirit of God has made you desire other believers to be your closest companions and your friends. You used to see his worship as something to avoid, but now you love to gather with God's people on his holy day to worship him. And the Spirit of God changes your, your view on 
obedience. Really, this whole psalm reflects how your attitude is going to change toward these commandments that you used to hate. You used to resist them, and even if you were like the, uh, the virtuous or we might say the uh, so-called virtuous pagan who may look at these commandments and say, really, these things are good. Even if you did think they were good, you never would have brought yourself to do them, or if you did, if you did keep them, it was only because they would benefit you in some way. I remember uh, John Gerstner using the illustration that, um, you know, perhaps you don't really love the law of God, but you see in it some advantage. If you follow a Christian ethic and you build, let's say, the best mousetrap, as it were, in Northampton, you're going to sell more mousetraps. And so you're going to do it, not because it's right, not because it's glorifying to God. You're going to give people a fair price for it, not because you necessarily want to give them a fair price. You want to make money, but you know that by doing this, you're going to make more money, sell more mousetraps. And so you do it because it benefits you and not because it really is good. But the Spirit of God changed that. Now you see the commandments are good. What they require is good. That this is really what you now want to be like. Now again, these changes, these new desires are the work of the Spirit of God in your heart. This particular section of Psalm 119 tells us something else of how now you're going to relate and respond to God's law. And that is especially during difficult times as compared to what you would have done when you didn't believe and when you didn't have the Spirit. I think to put this section simply, before, of course, you would have hated the law of God, which we've seen, and you wouldn't have submitted to it, but particularly when you were faced with difficulties, if, there, if there's ever a time when it is more difficult to obey the Lord than others, it's when you're going through difficult times because that's when you get stressed out, it's when your flesh grows even stronger, that's when you're going to be more tempted actually to hate God. But the Lord changes that, of course. Um, now you'll love it. Now you'll want to obey it. And particularly, you'll want to do it when things get tough. You know, as we read this psalm, I think um, we may be tempted as we look at what the psalmist expresses regarding this love that he has for God's law to believe that he's experiencing more than what we actually experience in our own lives, that there must be something wrong with us. Well, there is something wrong with us. It's called sin. We're still far from perfect. We're still far from what it is that the Lord calls us to be, but we do need to remember that that's true of every believer. No believer sees himself or herself as actually having arrived because God's truth is in them and because that truth that God has given them tells them that they haven't yet arrived. You and I haven't arrived. We're not going to be perfect, but we may, like the psalmist, express the desire to be perfect. But again, you're in good company because that is the heart of the saints. Paul told the Philippians that he hadn't yet reached perfection, but that he continued to strive towards it. He wrote to Timothy that he still viewed himself as the greatest of sinners, the greatest living sinner. Undoubtedly because of his past, but also because he was still keenly aware of the sin that was in his heart in the present. Paul says, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Now, again, Paul saw himself as the greatest of sinners, but we need to realize that he desired to be perfect, and that desire to be perfect is what made him see, I think, the depth of his sin. But in his striving to be perfect, he looked forward to the day when he actually would be perfect, when he would see the Lord in heaven. So again, may the Lord show us that even though we see these expressions, these high ideals and these desires, these aspirations of the psalmist, not to be too discouraged because the psalmist here had not reached this level either. But we should find ourselves at least desiring these things as we go through similar difficulties. So may the Lord help us to adopt this heart of the psalmist. 
as we consider how he responded when he was faced with difficulty. Now, maybe as we consider this portion of this psalm this evening, the Lord will encourage us as well not to give up, not to give up loving him, not to give up serving him, when we have to face the hatred of the world for doing what the Lord calls us to do, particularly in bringing the gospel to others. Now, I do believe the psalmist was in some type of a situation where he was being threatened by some physical enemy. I don't think he was necessarily out evangelizing, but I do believe that he was seeking to do God's will. Now, God's will for us is that we love him, honor him, and seek to bring the gospel to others. And as we do that, Jesus has reminded us that we are going to face the hatred of the world. So how should you respond when you find yourself doing what God calls you to do, and yet, like the psalmist, you are persecuted? Well, I, I believe the psalmist gives us several different things. And by the way, this will also show us the contrast between what the believer experiences in these situations versus what the unbeliever can expect to experience. Well, first of all, like the psalmist, you will look to the Lord for his help. That's what the psalmist does in verses 153 and 154. Look upon my affliction and rescue me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me, revive me according to your word. Uh, the first thing you'll do is you'll call upon the Lord to look at what it is you are going through. Not that the Lord doesn't already know what those things are, but that He would take note of it, take up your cause, and rescue you from your danger. As a matter of fact, I think we can sort of see a picture of that in the, in the Gospels when Peter, when he was in trouble, he asked Jesus to command him to come out to where he was walking on the water. And then as he looked at the wind and the waves and became afraid, he began to sink. And when he began to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Look on my affliction and rescue me. Now, it's not that Jesus didn't know the difficulty he was in because Jesus could see it. Jesus had actually commanded Peter to come out to him on the water. Peter was only asking him to do something about it. And as soon as he did, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and delivered him. I mean, that's what the psalmist is doing. Lord, look at my situation. Plead my cause. Come to my rescue. I know you see what's going on here, but take note of me and deliver me. Now, Jesus delivered Peter from his predicament, but why did he do that? Well, it's because Peter was his child. Peter had his spirit. Christ was being formed in him. He belonged to him, and it showed in his trying to obey Jesus. I mean, if anybody tried to obey Jesus, it was Peter, perhaps a little bit over-anxious on certain occasions, but I believe that he had the right heart, and he had the right heart because he had the Spirit of God. And I want you to notice the psalmist is basically pleading for God's help on that same basis. Look upon my affliction and rescue me, for I do not forget your law. Again and again, we see this recurring theme that obedience is the evidence that you belong to Jesus Christ. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Peter was seeking to do that. It showed that he loved Christ. It showed that he belonged to Christ. And if you obey Jesus, it shows that you love Jesus. And if you love him, it shows that you belong to Jesus. And if you belong to him, then he will hear you and he will answer you when you are in trouble. But I do want you to notice too that you'll do more than just pray that God would deliver you from this particular situation, whatever difficulties you may be in. If your obedience ends when the Lord answers, again, remember the foxhole conversion, it shows that you really don't love Him and you really don't belong to Him. But if, on the other hand, you pray that along with His deliverance from danger that He would deliver you from sin, this shows that you really are His, and I believe that that's what the psalmist is asking for, not just that God would deliver Him from His enemies, though He did desire that, but he primarily prays that God would revive him according to his word. That is, that he would 
do as he promised and give to him a renewed, refreshed spirit to love him and to serve him. So notice the psalmist is in a difficult situation. His opponents are coming after him, persecution. He says, look upon my affliction and rescue me in the midst of this. Instead of getting angry at God because of this opposition that he has to face, which is often what our experience is, the psalmist prays that God would strengthen him, revive him, to love him, and to obey him more. I mean, the psalmist knew that this was part of the price that he was going to have to pay for doing what the Lord had called him to do in the first place. When you live for God's glory, there is a price that is involved, and that price is hatred of the world. Well, he was willing to pay that, and he wanted in the midst of it to make sure that he was honoring to the Lord, even if the Lord shouldn't deliver him. Now, sometimes you and I get tempted to get angry at God when He puts you in difficult circumstances, especially when you get into trouble for doing what it is He calls you to do in the first place, and particularly because the church often tells us that when you do that, it's just going to be blessings all around. I don't know where you get that impression, but a lot of churches actually do teach that. But you do need to remember Jesus warned you ahead of time what the cost was going to be. That's what you signed up for, was difficulty, a difficult life. The cost of following Jesus is you are going to be hated as Jesus was hated. Again, remember what Jesus told His disciples, John 15, verses 18 and 19. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. In other words, the world would love you. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. It's not the planet that hates you. It's not like the the mountains are going to get upset at you, but it's the people of the world are going to hate you because you're going a different direction than they are going. You are following Jesus. They are following, as we saw this morning from Ephesians chapter 2, the prince of the power of the air, the god of this world. They're following Satan. And light and darkness don't mix. Darkness hates the light. And if you're shining the light of Christ, they're going to hate you. Well, again, that's what you signed up for. So this shouldn't be a surprise when it comes. But you also need to remember, too, when you do serve the Lord and difficulties come, you need to remember why the Lord brings the difficulties. Don't forget He's in control. He brings them because He knows you need those difficulties. You need those trials. Remember that trials are meant for your good. Trials are meant to expose your weaknesses. They're meant to purify you. They're meant to strengthen you. When you see your weakness, you call out to the Lord for greater strength, and the Lord gives it to you. You know, He actually does that in just about every area of life. You ever wondered why you're always getting provoked by those things that that, um, well, by the certain things that you particularly hate, whether it be a dog barking or whether it be stopping at stoplights, that's one thing I can kind of uh, say from my own experience, okay? If your weakness happens to be patience with stoplights, the Lord is going to make sure you get your fair share of red lights as you're driving through the city. I know that's, to be, that's true. He's also, if, if for instance, you, your weakness happens to be a bad temper, God's going to expose you to the things that will provoke it to show you a weakness that you might look to Him for strength. We do need to understand this because if we don't, then we pray and we ask God to strengthen our faith. We ask Him to give us patience. We ask Him for all these different things. And then we have all these things come down on us that provoke us in every way and we wonder what's going on. The Lord's only answering your prayer. He's only helping you to overcome those weaknesses. That's what trials are for, even these trials. We go out to do God's work and we're hated for it. It is to strengthen our resolve to love the Lord and to walk in His ways and to love even our enemies. The psalmist prayed in the midst of this trial that God would revive him, that He would renew his resolve to keep His commandments by the power of His Spirit because that's why the Lord sent the difficulty in the first place, and that is what you will do. If you know the Lord Jesus and if He's being formed in you, you will call upon the Lord for His help to see, and in the midst of the difficulty, you'll pray that God will give you the grace, renew you in His strength to honor Him in the midst of that difficulty. 
Now, secondly, when faced with opposition, you will encourage yourself by reminding yourself of God's mercies, the mercies He's shown you in the past when you've prayed in order to renew your hope that God is going to show you mercy in the present. Notice what He says in verse 156, great are your mercies, O Lord. And again, He prays, revive me according to your ordinances. The psalmist was Jewish and the Jews knew from the scriptures of God's mercy to His people in the past. He knew God had been merciful to them and I think the psalmist is looking to those past mercies. I think he's also looking to the mercies God has shown him personally in the past when he's been faced with difficulties and he cried out to the Lord and the Lord granted those to him. He knew that God's mercies were great, that they were far greater than anything he deserved because remember, mercy is something that no one deserves. Mercy is something God gives you when you actually deserve just the opposite. And I think mercy is often also something that God gives in the form of something good when you don't deserve it, though we typically define grace in that way. I think the psalmist is looking to God's mercies, His goodness and His grace in the past in the lives of his people, as well as in his own life. And he encourages, his, he encourages himself in those things, that God has been merciful before, God will be merciful again, and so he asks for mercy. But I want you to, again to notice what he asks for. He's not asking that God would again deliver him, although he does in the opening verses, but here he's saying, revive me according to your ordinances. And I believe what he means by here is he, he is asking for God's renewing strength, the strength of his spirit to revive him again in obedience. I think he seems to see that as a greater blessing than that God would rescue him from his enemies. Now, I believe that will be the burden of your heart as well if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, or since you know Him, uh, that you will desire in all these types of circumstances where your enemies are coming against you to honor God in the middle of that difficulty and that trial. I think that may be His greatest mercy that the Lord shows to us, that even when we do face opposition, and even if the Lord should not deliver us physically, that we might yet glorify Him in the middle of that circumstance. I think I told you before, and you're probably aware, that the early Christians um, almost, I mean, they saw this almost to the point of having a death wish, where they were turning themselves in that they might get martyred because they wanted to die for Jesus Christ. That's quite a, a, a switch, isn't it? From perhaps what we see ourselves experiencing today where we're afraid for our lives and sometimes we don't want to stand out as a believer because we're afraid we're going to be persecuted, they actually were almost lining up uh, in the Colosseum to be torn apart by wild uh, animals. I don't think we should obviously go that far, but you do need to realize that if the Lord should call you to pay the ultimate price for serving Him, that that's a great blessing. And I'm sure that those who actually did die for Him we're very thankful that God gave them that strength to glorify Him in the midst of death. We, not too long ago, we were looking at um, some characters in church history that actually did give their lives for serving the Lord. John Huss, William Tyndale. As we looked uh, in our past Reformation series, we saw there were other characters like Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer and Thomas Cranmer. There's a host of others who were not willing to deny the Lord Jesus Christ in the face of their enemies, and so were put to death for that. But they were thankful that God answered their prayer to give them the strength to do that, which is what the psalmist is praying here, that the Lord would grant to him grace and revive him uh, according to his ordinances, give him the strength to obey him in the face of his enemies. I think that was more important to him than that the Lord deliver him from his enemies. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, that is what you will experience as well. To desire that God would give you grace to glorify him, obey him and serve him, even though you have to suffer for it. Uh, 
not to, to set you free from the suffering so much, but to honor him in it. Now, thirdly, the psalmist in his example shows us that if Christ is being formed in you, that you will resolve to obey him no matter how many turn against you. In verse 157, he says, many are my persecutors and my adversaries, yet I do not turn aside from your testimonies. It didn't really matter how many people were going to hate him for doing what God called him to do. He wasn't going to turn aside from his devotion to the Lord's. You know, as I read this passage, I couldn't help but thinking about Athanasius, another character in church history. Again, somebody who lived, somebody who served the Lord, somebody who was persecuted for it. And I could just see how the Lord might encourage Athanasius through this passage or perhaps passages like it as he seemingly stood alone against practically the entire world in this matter of the, what was called the Arian heresy, where the belief had, or at least the idea had been proposed that Jesus Christ, at least with regard to his pre-incarnate nature, was not the eternal Son of God, that he was not the same substance as the Father. In other words, he was not the eternal God, but rather he was created. He was a created son. Athanasius stood against that, and he believed that Jesus Christ was of the same substance of the Father. He believed in the Trinity. You see, that was what was at stake at this particular uh, time in history. And if you'll recall, when Athanasius died, what they wrote on his tombstone was Athanasius against the world. It seemed as though Athanasius was the only one standing for the truth, but by God's grace, the truth won out. Now, sometimes it may seem like you're the only one who is actually taking a stand for the Lord. And whether it seems that way or whether you really are the only one who is standing for Him on that particular occasion, this should be your resolve. Never to turn away from loving the Lord and being devoted to the Lord and doing His will, being a witness for Him no matter how many turn against you, even if it seems like the whole world turns against you, even if the entire world should actually, all, all of Christendom, all, of, all Christians should suddenly deny the Lord Jesus Christ and the world turn against you, you need to take your stand and stand firm. That's what Athanasius did because that's what Jesus did. Even his own disciples uh, ran away from him because they were afraid. They didn't take their stand. But you see, if Christ is being formed in you, then that's also what you're going to do. You're going to stand for Him, no matter how many of your friends, no matter how many people that you uh, know that call themselves Christians, uh, turn against the Lord, you are not going to turn against Him. You're still going to do what is honoring to Him. Now, fourthly, when faced with opposition, and here's that sensitive area again we dealt with earlier in this psalm, there is going to be a sense in which you are going to despise the unbeliever or the enemy that's coming against you because of their disobedience. Notice what the psalmist says in verse 158, I behold the treacherous and loathe them because they do not keep your word. What about Christ's command to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you? I don't think that this mitigates against that, but I think we are again reminded of the two perspectives that we have in Scripture towards unbelievers that, that we are to have. Uh, when you see unbelievers doing what God hates, when you see them doing what you hate because Christ is being formed in you, when you see them dishonoring God, I mean, you can't help but hate what they're doing, right? I mean, I think we'd all agree we need to hate what they're doing. But since they're the ones doing it, I think there's a sense in which you can't help but hate them as enemies of the one you love. I mean, have you ever experienced that? Perhaps you've caught yourself and said, oh, I shouldn't do that because I'm supposed to love my enemy. What about God's enemies? What about the imprecatory psalms? What about all the times that the psalmist cries out to God to destroy the wicked, crush their teeth, break their arms, and, and things of that nature? Well, we see that again here in the case of the psalmist. I behold the treacherous and loathe them not because they're coming against me, notice, but from the Godward perspective, because they don't keep your word, Lord, these are dishonoring to you, and I hate them because they are dishonoring to you. 
But there is another perspective, and I think that's the other perspective we're more familiar with, and that is as your enemies. You see, the Lord calls you to love them. I mean, God is even kind to those that hate Him, constantly, you know, blaspheme Him, that don't do His will, that even purposely break His commandments. God is, is kind to the unjust. He causes His rain to shine, or His, his rain to fall, and the just and the unjust, and his, his sun to shine on both. And I don't think He's talking allegorically there. The sun is a blessing. The rain is a blessing. He gives good gifts to all men. Even he is kind to his enemies, and he calls us to do exactly the same thing. So here's the other perspective with which we view the unbeliever, that they are fellow human beings capable also of being saved, of receiving God's mercy, that you were once like they were, but God had mercy on you, and but by God's grace, there go I. That Jesus calls you to love your enemies, and he even showed you how to do it on the cross when he prayed for those who crucified him. Uh, you can't help, as you think about it from that perspective, to love them and to pray that the Lord might have mercy on their souls. I think, again, if I can just maybe share one other um, thing that might elucidate this, might illustrate a little bit more. I mean, there's a sense in which, uh, you know, God, when he views the wicked who are suffering in hell for their sins, there's a sense in which he's pleased with that because his justice is, is being served. They're being justly punished for their wickedness, and yet we read in Scripture, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his ways and be saved. God doesn't take pleasure in the suffering of one of his creatures in hell, as he would just consider that suffering in and of itself, but if they're suffering justly for the sins they have committed against him, then he can take pleasure in in that. So again, there's differing perspectives that the Bible gives us on how we view others. There's a sense in which we may hate them, but there's a sense in which we also need to love them and pray that the Lord would have mercy on them. But again, here the psalmist is pointing out the first perspective, they are God's enemies and He loathes them because they're treacherous against Him. So that will also be a part of your response, as it were, toward the wicked who come against you, not because they're coming against you, but because they're coming against God. Now, fifthly, when they oppose God and when they oppose you for following Him, it will provoke you to love God's law more and to desire more to keep it. He says in verses 159 and 160, as he thinks about the treacherous and he loathes them because they don't keep God's law, he says, consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. Their hatred provokes him to love the law more and to pray that God would strengthen his love for it more, and that's what it should do with you. Strengthen your desire to keep it because they are so dishonoring to Him. And again, I want you to notice the psalmist calls upon God's loving kindness. Revive me according to your loving kindnesses, according to your mercy, according to your grace, because the psalmist sees in God's law everything that is good, everything that is right, and because it's good and right that it's going to stand forever. So this is the response of the believer. This is how he views God's law. This is what he does when he's under persecution. This is what he can expect from God, help to deliver him. He can expect, of course, help in keeping and obeying God's law in the face of his adversaries. And again, that's what you can expect if you know the Lord and you are trusting him. But there is one verse in here that I skipped over that has to do with the unbeliever. You know, what is his experience? How does he view the law? What can he expect from God? Well, first of all, the unbeliever doesn't want to know what God commands. Verse 155, they do not seek your statutes. They don't want to know what God says because they don't want to do what He says. They hate the, the law of God. They don't want it to get in the way of what they really want to do, which is sin. And so they'll try to remain as ignorant as they possibly can of what God actually requires. Remember what we saw this morning where Paul gives us a picture of the heart of the unbeliever. 
particularly towards the law of God. In Romans 8, verses 7 and 8, the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, hates God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The unbeliever hates God, Paul is saying. And so they hate his laws because it reflects his holiness and that's exactly what they hate about God. And secondly, the psalmist says, because they hate him and because they're not going to obey him when they get into trouble, as oftentimes unbelievers do, and they look to the Lord for help. He's not going to answer them. Again, in verse 155, he says, salvation is far from the wicked. And why is it far from the wicked? Because they do not seek your statutes. Since they don't listen to him, God's not going to listen to them. Now, this is one of the greatest dangers if you don't know the Lord, if you're putting off repentance, if you're putting off trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, is that God's not going to help you. He's not bound himself to help you. Now, does that mean that God's never going to hear and answer the prayers of an unbeliever? Well, there is one prayer that he promises he'll answer, and that is when the unbeliever turns from his sins and he throws himself on the Lord Jesus Christ and asks for his mercy. That's a prayer that the Lord will answer. But there's also perhaps other circumstances in which God will. I mean, he may answer these prayers when he wants to because he's, he's gracious, because he's good. But we do need to realize that he hasn't bound himself to answer the prayers of an unbeliever. He hasn't bound himself to do it for them as he has for you. God says, if you've trusted his son, he will hear you. He will answer you as soon as you pray. Even before the words are on your lips, he knows and he's, he's, he's going to answer you. He's going to answer you in his timing, of course. But again, he may or may not with regard to the unbeliever. Now, if you haven't trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, just because God answers your prayers sometimes, that doesn't mean that he necessarily has received you as his child. I mean, some people actually do use that to prove to themselves that God has saved them. I prayed and he heard me. I prayed and he delivered me from this circumstance. Well, God cares about me. He loves me. There's a lot of people who actually do that, but that doesn't mean you're safe because God sometimes answers the prayers of unbelievers. If that is your hope this evening, don't rest in that. That's only because of God's goodness that He gives you these good things. You can only rest in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. And the evidence that you actually are resting in Him and trusting in Him is the fact that you're repenting of your sins and you are obeying Him and you are seeking to know His full will so that you can obey Him more closely even in the midst of difficulties. Don't rest in answered prayer. Rest in Christ alone and the evidence of holiness in your life, that Christ is being formed in you. Now again, with regard to those of you who do know Him, be encouraged from this with regard to your service to the Lord when you seek to do His will, when you reach out to others with the gospel and you meet with opposition and even persecution. You can call out to the Lord. And the Lord will hear you. The Lord will help you. And you can know that He will because, of the, again, of the evidences of His grace within His heart, which we've seen in the psalmist. You can know that He will because of His past mercies. You called out to Him in the past and He did deliver you, even as He did His people in the Old Covenant and in the New Covenant. You can know that He will because when you have been opposed in the past, and people have persecuted you that you haven't turned away from Him. Or if you have, you've repented and now you're willing to do His will again. You can know that God is going to help you because you do have a holy aversion to those who actually do break His commandments. You have a holy jealousy for His honor and it shows that Christ is working in you. And you can know He's going to help you because when you see people disobeying the Lord, it provokes in you a greater desire and a greater resolve to seek the Lord 
that he would strengthen your love and your obedience to him, that while they're dishonoring him, you will honor him. That is your heart. In other words, you know that the Lord is going to help you because Christ is being formed in you. Again, that is the grounds upon which you can know that you are a believer. And it's also the grounds upon which you can know that, like Peter, when you call out to the Lord Jesus Christ and you say, Lord, help me, Lord, save me, that he's going to reach out his hand immediately and he is going to help you. And now that help is going to be in the form he desires it to be, not in the form you desire it to be, but it will be help. And it will be what you need and it will be what is best for you. Well, may the Lord encourage us that there is help for those of us who've trusted the Lord, that he will help us in the face of this opposition so we don't need to be afraid. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to um, put or to, you know, again, realizing that what the psalmist is expressing here is simply the heart of Christ. It's simply what is true of our Lord Jesus Christ as the Spirit is forming this in Him. Let's pray that the Lord would form that same heart within us, that same trust, that same desire to serve Him no matter what.